Welcome to Spring Creek Church. Whether this is your first time or you have been with us before, we are so excited that you are here. If you'd like to know more about our church, text NEW to 96995. And if you're attending our Garland campus, be sure to stop by Community Life in the lobby. We have a lot of great events that are happening this month. Here are a few to check out. Be sure to visit springcreekchurch.org slash events for more details and to see everything that is coming up. We wanted to say thank you to all those who give to the mission of Spring Creek Church. Your generosity allows us to help those in our community here and around the world. Visit springcreekchurch.org slash give to see all the ways your giving is making a difference. Thanks for being with us today. Welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. We're really grateful that you would choose to carve out this time to be with us today in a brand new series that we're calling The Way. If you weren't here last week, please, by all means, go online, listen to that message. We're building off of that message. Uh, you, you will get so much out of that when you come to understand how the spiritual life begins, how God is awakening us, what exactly God is doing to draw us to himself. Today's message, we're going further. We're going to be talking about embarking. Let me just say up front, because this is, this is just going to be an issue in all these messages. You know, for years, I've worked alongside a number of different pastors who've worked in our area of Christian discipleship, of helping people on the way. And many times I found myself having to explain to these pastors really the way the spiritual life develops. Uh, because some of them were young, some of them hadn't really reflected on their journey, Someone, some of them didn't really understand the fullness of this journey of what it means to be on the way. And so what we wanted to do is, at the first of this year, is just dedicate some time and in five weeks' time, kind of give you the 30,000-foot view of the spiritual life and how we grow in that walk with God. Uh, so by necessity, I'm going to be going back and revisiting some material you've heard me go over before. Uh, but I put it together. It's, it's different. These are different messages. I've never done these messages before. But I've combined them so that we will have a real clear understanding of how God begins his work in our life, how that develops, how we grow, how we cooperate with him. And this message is no different. So join me as we get started in a word of prayer. Father, I am so grateful that you are my God, that I love you, that uh, I get to follow you, and I have the privilege of leading this wonderful group of people. I ask that today, as we gather around your word, that you're just going to have complete freedom in all of our hearts and all of our minds to really speak into us, God, those areas where we're needing to grow, where we're needing to be challenged, where we need to surrender. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Ken Canfield tells this really interesting story about a theology class at seminary where the students were to devote the entire course to learning about God. On the first day of the semester, the professor handed out a personal questionnaire. So many of these questions on the survey had to deal with the student's perception of their fathers and the relationship they had with him. The surveys were collected, and no more was said about it. Over the course of the next several months, studying about God, the students pretty much forgot about those initial surveys. But at the end of the course, the professor handed out a second survey. This time, the students were supposed to record their honest perceptions of God and their feelings about their relationship with him. But here's a twist. The questions were exactly the same as on the first survey, except this time the questions were about God, their heavenly father, and not their earthly dads. When the professor returned the survey, including the previously forgotten one, the students were astounded that even after a whole semester of studying about God, they still had trouble differentiating their relationship with God from their relationship with their dads. Both sets of answers were remarkably similar. Bottom line, good teaching alone can't change the imprinting on our souls. So in order to change people's God image, we need more than just good information. Because, you see, I can teach you all day long the truth about who God is as he's revealed in Scripture, but many times our hearts won't let our minds embrace those truths. We got wounds. Uh, we're limited by our experiences. So we don't always experience God in his fullness. We talked about this last week, how often it is that the image of God that we have tethered to our hearts is distorted by the relationships we've had in this world. That God image needs healing. 
Now, I can tell you from personal experience, this is exactly what happened to me. I spent five years in Bible college, three in graduate school at Dallas Theological Seminary. And regardless of having excellent teachers, regardless of years of studying scripture, my experience with God always seemed to mirror my relationship with my dad. In the same way, I never felt really close to my dad. I I found it difficult to feel close to God. Because of my father's abandonment, I had no real sense of security in my relationship with God and lived in constant fear that I would somehow disappoint him and that he might find similar reasons to reject me. I felt like God was disinterested in my life, just like I felt with my own father, who was never really all that interested in me, my life, or what I was becoming. For most people, this is one of the first realities we face on the way. We have to come to terms with both who we are and who God is. And that's what today's message is all about. So first, to make any real advancement in the spiritual life, to truly be a follower of the way, we must first be the sort of people who come to terms with our own brokenness. And that's what this first point is all about, coming to terms with human brokenness. Whenever we remain stuck where we are, or or whether we remain stuck or where we are, when it comes down to our pursuit of Christ, this is the first question we have to answer. Are you honest enough to admit your spiritual poverty? Jesus taught us this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Weiss translation puts it this way, spiritually prosperous are the destitute and helpless in the realm of the spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says to a people who think that striking at rich is the blessed life, that the blessed life begins when you understand that you're begging poor in the spiritual life. In the spiritual realm, the first step to freedom is admitting there's a problem. So God tells us that the path of blessing begins with an acknowledgement of our messes, our most devastating, vulnerable, secret, difficult, stumbling, failed, sinful, embarrassing, and painful experiences in our lives. We have to own all that, confess it, admit it just to begin the spiritual life. Listen to Johnny Erickson Tata describe it. Little wonder the gospel is only good news to those who consider themselves losers. It is humiliating to be sandblasted to the core, to be told by the Spirit that we're not as wise or winsome or loving or patient as we thought. But when the mask of pride is ripped away, there's something refreshing about knowing yourself at the core, the vulnerability, the transparency, the relief of nothing more to hide. You see, by owning our own brokenness, it's not saying that everyone out there is an addict or everyone out there has done, done or said horrible things. because. Things like addiction and lust and anger issues and lying and theft, they're just symptoms of the real problem. You see, the real problem all of us share in common is what this next point is all about. The nature of human brokenness is it's bent toward selfishness. So Jesus has an encounter with a young man that really drives this truth home. Jesus talked to this man about eternal life. The key to understanding this story, though, is a strategic omission on the part of Jesus. Listen to the story and see if you can spot what's missing. The Bible says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he he declared, All these I have kept since I was a boy. So the guy asks Jesus, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. Then he lists them. Now, Jesus doesn't mention the first four commandments, but that's not the omission I'm talking about. The first four commandments address our relationship with God. No other gods before me, no graven images, don't use his name in vain, and remember the Sabbath day. Jesus didn't mention any of those. Instead, Jesus focused on the last commandments that have to do with our relationship to others. But in that list, he leaves off one. So after Jesus enumerates these commandments, the young man answers confidently that he's met all the requirements. But like I said, out of the six commandments that deal with our relationship to other people, Jesus intentionally leaves out one. Here's something I've learned in studying the Bible for all these years. Whenever you find a list in the Bible with something intentionally left out, you better set up and take notice. The one commandment Jesus left out was the very one that would most reveal this young man's heart. Jesus left out the last commandment, the 10th one, don't covet. So get this, 
what's unique about the commandments that Jesus does list is that each of them manifests itself in a specific external observable behavior. If you murder, there's a body. If you lie, you've spoken something to others here. If you commit adultery, you've committed a physical act. If you steal, you have something in your possession that doesn't belong to you. So if you read the law like this young man did in a very superficial and external way, you might conclude that you've successfully kept the law which is what people still do to this day. We look at the Ten Commandments and think, I'm a pretty good person because I don't do any of those things that are forbidden. But what you can say about the other commandments, you cannot say about the tenth. Coveting is unique because it addresses something that can't be seen. Coveting is about the heart. Coveting is the one commandment that lays bare the fact that we're broken people because all of us, our internal wanter is broken. That's also why this is the one sin most people never confess, because it's unseen. It's easy to deny it. It's the one sin that shows us most our sinfulness. I want what I want, and I want it more than what's best for you or even what God wants. Coveting is a big deal in the Bible. It's the original sin. I mean, think about it. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve didn't commit murder, lie, or steal. They coveted. They had everything they could ever want. There was only one thing they were denied, and what they were denied, they decided they simply had to have. That's the sin of coveting. Paul, in the New Testament, tells us how coveting uniquely exposes the human heart. Listen to what he wrote in Romans. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. You know, it's so easy to deny our sinfulness, especially when we define sin by its most egregious external acts. But when I see sin the way God sees sin, as something that begins in the heart, as something that has its origin in wanting what God has chosen not to give, then my sinfulness becomes undeniable. Something else I should point out, 10 in the Bible is the number of completeness, which means coveting is the 10th commandment for a reason. There's something about this command that makes it the perfect summation of all the others. So consider this. Before we commit any of the other sins that Jesus mentioned, don't we first covet? I mean, my failure to honor my parents flows out of a desire to honor myself over them. I covet the honor for myself. When I murder, the value of your life is insignificant compared to my need for revenge or to get what I want. Adultery is a direct result of wanting a relationship that God has chosen not to give us. Stealing obviously has its taproot in coveting, and we lie to get what is not ours. All sin begins with coveting. All sin is the result of my broken wanter. It's the most fundamental aspect of what it means to be a sinner. I covet. I'm selfish. I prioritize my needs over yours. My desires are messed up. It's why the Bible says it like this. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And each of us has turned where? To our own way. To turn to your own way is to covet. It's to be selfish. That's what it means to be a sinner. Not that you've committed adultery, lied, stolen, or murder. Yes, those are sins. But first and foremost, you and I are guilty of wanting things that God has chosen not to give us. We want our way. James reminds us that even as adults, we face the similar sin issue. Where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and fight for it deep inside yourself. I want what I want. That's what it means to be a sinner. A lot of us are are not accustomed to thinking of sin in these terms. Instead, we think like the young man who's confident in his morality because we look at sin in its worst and most outward expression, and then we congratulate ourselves that we're nothing like that. But if the taproot of all sin is coveting, If the real problem that leads to all other problems is selfishness, then we're all in a heap of trouble. The truth is none of us have to be taught to think of ourselves. It's our default setting. Even your nine-month-old baby has already learned how to make a scene when someone takes something from them. The great thinker C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Problem of Pain, at this very moment, you and I are either committing selfishness or about to commit it or repenting it. Selfishness is a serious problem, and it's as natural to us as breathing. It's the human condition, the taproot of sin, that I will think of me before I think of you, and most definitely before I think of God. So we all need God to reverse what we're powerless to change, and that leads us to this. Who is God, and how does he deal with our broken condition? 
A.W. Tozer said it best, the most important thing about you is what comes to mind when you think of God. And why is our God concept so vitally important? Well, Tozer Tozer goes on to say, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. Somebody once asked the theologian R.C. Sproul, what's the greatest spiritual need in the world today? Sproul's answer was simply this, the greatest need in people's lives is to understand the true identity of God. Emmett Fox, another spiritual giant, said, what you think about God is like, what you think God is like will determine your whole life. That's the central question we all have to wrestle with. So once we turn toward God, he begins to show us who he is. And the best and clearest way he did that was through his son, Jesus Christ, which is what this next point is all about. Jesus came to teach us how good God is. Came to teach us how good God is. Jesus once told a story to help us get to know what his father was actually like, and here's what he said. If your little boy asks you for a serving of fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? If your little girl asks for an egg, do you trick her with a spider? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. And don't you think the father who conceived you in love will give you the Holy Spirit when you ask him? God is the father who made you, loves you, and sustains you. God is not some cold, angry, distant bureaucrat in the sky. God is like a good mom or a good dad who gives good things to their children. It's only when I begin to see and trust in his goodness that I feel the freedom to really bring my whole self, my real self, into the relationship. Now, let me tell you something from the heart. The goodness of God is not some minor league truth about God in the Bible. It's one that gets major airtime in Scripture from cover to cover and has huge implications for how we relate to God. The goodness of God is a lens, it's a perspective through which we have to see all of life's circumstances. It's a worldview. It's a set of glasses, if you will, through which you interpret everything around me. It leads me to say things like, I may not know why this is happening, but I know God is good. I don't know the answer to that question, but I know God is good. I might be hurting and confused, but I know God is good. You know, a lot of words become meaningless through overuse. Take, for example, the word nice. Uh, What does that even mean today? If you try to fix up a single friend with someone and and they ask you to describe them and you say, well, they're nice, (laughs) they'll instantly ask you, okay, what's wrong with them? People don't want to hear the word nice. They want to hear attractive, intelligent, engaging, passionate, stunning. (laughs) Nice is just not a nice word anymore. That's also what we've done with the word good. Good just isn't what it used to be. If if you tell someone they did a good job, they think it was only good. In our competitive, high-achieving society, no one wants to be good. You want to be stellar, skilled, charismatic, and gifted, but not good. Good sounds like average or below average. And since we've done this to the word good, it gets in the way of our understanding of God. And one of the very first things we ever learn about God is that he is good. For many of us, our first introduction to theology was a prayer over mealtimes. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Or we say in church, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. But what does that mean? Well, it means God's nature is good. His desires are good. His actions toward us are always good. And every one of his attributes is expressed first and foremost through his goodness. From cover to cover in the Bible, the one attribute of God that the biblical authors keep coming back to again and again is this simple yet profound truth that God is good. You know that even our English word for God is a derivative of the Saxon word for good? God's name is derived from the word good. So when we say God is good, we mean that his love is good, his his power is good, his mercy is good, and his holiness is good. I mean, think about it. If God had power but didn't have love, he would not be good. If he had patience but didn't have wisdom, he would not be good. Goodness defines who God is and marks everything that he does. So what God longs to do is change your image of him. Change it so you can see him as he really is. Change it so that it becomes the lens through which you view all of life. And that leads to this next principle. You see, not only did Jesus teach us how good God is, he also came to model how good God is. Basically, if you want to see God more clearly, you have to see Jesus more clearly. Jesus himself once said, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. So Jesus revealed God. 
In fact, based on what he said, Jesus is the clearest picture of God we ever got. You don't see God as clearly in the Old Testament as you do in the person of Jesus Christ. So if you want to know what God is like, look no further than the life of Jesus. The way I like to say it is this, God is as good as Jesus made him out to be. That's one of those statements you should memorize, honestly. I mean, if I had a plaque in my home, it wouldn't say, eat, pray, love. It would say, God is as good as Jesus made him out to be. I have thought about that truth for hours. I've meditated on it. I've carried it in my heart on my long walks and on the hikes with God. I've rehearsed it over and over again until I no longer doubted it. All day long, for days on end, I would meditate and repeat the phrase, God is as good as Jesus made him out to be. You see, if you really believe that, then it's difficult to embrace this idea that somehow God is looking down on people and saying things, you know, I need to discipline you, so I'm going to give you inoperable cancer. Or she's unkind, I think I'm going to cause her to lose all of her family in a tragic car accident so she'll come around. Because you don't get that image from Jesus. Folks, Jesus brought healing. He never brought disease. He gave help. He never sent tragedy. I let Jesus' life define God for me because he said to see him is to see the Father. He also said he only did what he saw his Father doing. So Jesus' actions in the gospel perfectly sync up with that of his Father. You want to know why I tell young believers to begin by reading the gospels? Because they'll see Jesus and as a result come to better understand who God is. So learn to meditate on the person of Christ. Memorize, meditate, and repeat the phrase, God is as good as Jesus made him out to be. Spend a lot of time in the Gospels getting to know Jesus so you can have a clearer image of God. He modeled for us what God is like so that we would have no doubts about his goodness. And then there's this, Jesus died to show us how good God is. He taught it, he modeled it, and he died to show us. You know, I'd like to talk to you about something I call soul fear, because it's the one fear out of which every other fear you have grows. Until you deal with this fear, all the others will persist. Soul fear is about the fear that we're not lovable. And the only remedy to soul fear is knowing that you are absolutely, totally, unconditionally loved as you are. The truth is, we all need this unconditional love. We have to have it. And to be perfectly honest, we can't get this from other people. I hear people say it all the time. I give unconditional love to so-and-so. You don't. Not moms, not dads, not grandparents, not siblings, not teachers, not lovers or spouses, because no human being is capable of absolute unconditional love. I'm sorry to have to say that, but it's true. If there's anything I could ever do to you or anything I might do that would make you love me less, then it fails the test of unconditional love. That's the bad news. And it also happens to be the reason why many of us stay trapped in soul fear. We try to get unconditional love from people who are incapable of giving it to us. But the good news is this. This is the way God loves. It's why John wrote this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with, with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Perfect love, that's God's love, not your love, not my love. Only God loves perfectly. Only God knows absolutely everything about us and loves us fully and completely. Only God knows everything we will ever think and do and yet is firmly committed to keep on loving us, no strings attached. God loves us without condition. Now, I want you to think about this. Suppose that I could, with God's help, truly love my own daughter unconditionally. Suppose that were possible, but let's say the whole time I'm loving her unconditionally, she's de desperately trying to please me. Would she even notice the unconditional nature of my love? No, she wouldn't. She wouldn't really see it. She wouldn't really experience it. Why? She wouldn't experience it because she would be trying to earn it. In fact, receiving love while you're trying to earn love only reinforces the effort to be lovable. Because no matter what sort of love she would be receiving, she would still believe in her heart she's receiving it because she's good or doing things that please me. So rather than being changed by my love, it would only increase her efforts to earn love. And that leads to this important point. It's not the fact of being loved unconditionally that's life-changing. It's the experience of allowing myself to be loved unconditionally. Friends, God does love you unconditionally. That's a fact. But knowing that truth in your head is not going to change your life. 
you have to allow yourself to be loved unconditionally. So how does that happen? In what circumstances could you know that you're loved without condition? When you're at your best or when you're at your worst? Well, obviously at your worst. When you're loved at your best, you think you deserve it. You think you earned it. You think you're worthy of it. Just like in the illustration with me and my daughter. But when you're loved at your worst, and God whispers, I'm very fond of you, at a time when you're beating yourself up badly, when you experience the love of God at your worst, you finally and truly know that you're loved. That's the only place you can experience the unconditional love of God at your worst. This is why the Bible emphasizes this. God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the way God's love has been from the beginning. While, while we're still sinners, at our worst, God loves us, which means that God's love anticipates our failure. He knows we're going to fail. He knows we're going to sin, yet he still loves us. He still calls us his beloved. There's nothing you can do to earn God's love, so there's nothing you can do to unearn it. There's nothing you could do to make God love you more, so there's nothing you could do to make God love you less. The key to spiritual transformation is meeting God in your most vulnerable state. The spiritual life is not about only bringing your best parts, your most presentable parts to God. All that is is an attempt to earn the love of God. The only way your life and mine is changed is when you dare to trust his perfect love by coming to him in your shame, in your weakness, and in your sin. And this is impossible when you're playing the game of pretend. When I bring my dismal failure <laughs> once again to God, in those times I hear him say, I love you, and nothing you ever do is going to change that. I mean, think about it. If, if God only affirmed us when we did it right, would that ever set us free? Or would it merely strengthen our approval addictions? When God meets you in your failure with his amazing love, you finally rest in him. Today, I live from a very settled place in my relationship with God. And what I know beyond a shadow of a doubt is this. My father is very fond of me. Can you say that to yourself? If not, it's because you haven't experienced, not truly, not fully, the unconditional love of God. At some level, you're still faking it with God. You haven't learned to trust him with your worst. So on this journey called the way, at every turn, we need to ask ourselves the question, are we reinforcing the lies or are we living the truth? So what does it mean to believe in Jesus? The Bible says this in its most famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And how about this verse? But these have been written... But these have been written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. When we say the word believe, we typically mean we give mental assent to something. We, we think of believing as a passive cerebral event. It all just happens in our head. But the Greek word for believe is more than that. It, it means to put our confidence in the thing, to entrust ourselves to its truth. So to believe is not like saying, I believe the grass is green or the sky is blue. In the Bible, to believe is to have complete confidence in the thing, to believe it so much that I entrust my entire life and existence to it. So when I say I believe in Jesus, it's not just saying I believe that he existed and did the things the Bible says he di did. It's saying I believe Jesus is the Son of God, therefore his words don't fall into the category of take it or leave it. His words are the difference between life and death. Everything he said, everything he did has profound implications for the way I am to live. I have complete confidence in who Jesus is and what he accomplished, so I'm going to follow him in all his ways. I live like my life depends on it. You know, Ken Davis shared this story about how one time in college, he was asked to prepare a speech where he would be graded on both his creativity and ability to drive a point home in a very memorable way. So the title of his talk was The Law of the Pendulum. So for 20 minutes, Davis carefully taught the physics that govern the swinging of the pendulum. Basically, the law of the pendulum states that a pendulum can never return to a point higher than the point from which it was released. Because of things like friction and gravity, when the pendulum returns, it will always fall short of its original release point. Each time it swings, it makes less and less of an arc until it finally comes to rest. The resting point is called a state of equilibrium where all forces acting on the pendulum are equal. 
So what Davis did is he attached a three foot string to a child's toy top and secured it at the top of a blackboard with a thumbtack. He pulled the top to one side, made a mark on the blackboard where he let it go. And each time it swung back, he made a new mark and it took less than a minute for the top to complete its swinging and come to rest. When the demonstration was over, the markings on the blackboard proved his thesis. He then asked how many of his classmates believed the law of the pendulum was true. Every one of them raised their hands, as did the teacher. The teacher, thinking the speech was over, started walking to the front of the classroom. But Davis's speech actually had just begun. Because hanging from the steel ceiling beams in the middle of the room was a large, crude, but functional pendulum. 250 pounds of metal weights tied to four strands of 500 pound test parachute cord. He invited the teacher to climb up on a table and sit in a chair with the back of his head against a concrete wall. Davis then brought the 250 pounds of metal up to the teacher's nose. Holding the pendulum just a fraction of an inch from his face, he once again explained the law of the pendulum. And he said, if the law of the pendulum is true, then when I release this massive metal, it will swing across the room and return short of the release point. Your nose will be in no danger. Now, after stating that, he looked the teacher in the eye and he asked, sir, do you believe this law is true? There was a long pause. Huge beads of sweat formed on his upper lip and then he nodded and whispered, yes. David released, or Davis, he released the pendulum. It, it made this swishing sound as it arced across the room. At the far end of its swing, it paused momentarily, then started back. The classroom never saw a man move so fast in their life. The teacher literally dove off the table. Davis then is asked his classmates, does our teacher believe in the law of the pendulum? And the students unanimously answered, no. When I say I believe in Jesus, it's like Ken Davis asking his teacher if he believed in the law of the pendulum. Not do you give mental assent to this truth, but do you stake your life on this truth? Do your beliefs manifest themselves in how you live? The other thing I want to tell you is that Christ exchanges my sinfulness for God's goodness. That's what the Bible says. Look at this verse. God was in Christ restoring the world to himself, no longer counting men's sins against them, but blotting them out. God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange, he poured God's goodness into us. On the cross, all of my sin was put onto Jesus and judged. Then God his goodness was poured into me. This is what we call the great exchange. My rags for his riches, my badness for his goodness, my sin for his righteousness. The gospel doesn't just offer forgiveness for my bad record, but also promises me complete acceptance through Christ's perfect record. This has been God's plan all along. He wants to make all things right again. That's what righteousness really means anyway, to make things right. Righteousness is God righting the wrong that sin has worked in our soul, distorting our emotions, deceiving our thinking, holding captive our will to sin, damaging our relationships, keeping us from him. God begins to reverse the curse of selfishness. You need Jesus to make that right. Christ loved you when you were unlovely. Christ sought you when you were not looking. Christ clothed you when you were naked. Christ traded his life for yours. He looked you in the eye before your execution and traded places with you. He was charged with your sins. You were credited with his righteousness. That's God's plan of salvation. And we believe that. We commit our lives to it. We stake our future on it. We live like forgiven people who don't have to earn God's approval. In Christ, we stand covered in the robes of righteousness. So as we pursue God and God faithfully reveals himself to us, he shows us his plan to make right what is wrong, to reverse the curse of selfishness in our heart, to pay the penalty for sin so that we, we don't have to, and to take up residence inside of us. So you believe? do you believe that? And do you live like it's true? And it leads me to this final question, how do I know if it's real and if it works? You see, God creates a human heart. God creates a new heart within the human self. His work of regeneration provides a new source for righteous living, new aspirations, and a new power for service. As God promised through the prophet Ezekiel, he said, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk 
in my statutes. Paul sums up this divine transformation like this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But it leads to a question, doesn't it? And David Benner said it really well. If an encounter with the divine love is so transformational, how is it that so many of us have survived such encounters relatively unchanged? The Bible talks a lot about transformation, conversion, if you will. A change so significant that when it comes over a person, it's like passing from death to life. The person's a brand new creation. Paul wrote, the old is gone, the new has come. The Bible uses very strong language to describe this new birth, even the term new birth. When a person embraces Christ as their forgiver and leader, the change is so profound, it's like this person has been born all over again. Uh, if that's what the new life is, then why isn't that always apparent? Why isn't alcoholism instantly cured? Why, why don't ingrained habits of selfishness and anger and arrogance immediately go away? Why don't the redeemed always look like the redeemed? This is an important question because it goes back to what we were talking about last week. Pharisees are quick to judge people by the most superficial and external things. But what I told you last week is that God is always looking primarily to see the direction that our life is heading. It's the difference between bounded set thinking and centered set thinking. But the same thinking is still as at work as we move along this journey on the way. Someone will genuinely trust Christ's work on the cross for their healing and forgiveness. But on the outside, they're still pretty rough. They still have a ways to go. They may still struggle with some attitudes and behaviors that are very unchristlike. Does that mean redemption didn't work? In other words, why do some people appear to be more changed than others? You see, there are plenty of Christians who look at young believers and judge them in the same way as they did outsiders. They look at them and they think, well, they don't act Christian enough. Uh, they think that no Christian can still struggle with addiction or compulsions, or no real Christian would ever smoke, drink, or cuss, or do this or that. Whatever box they put around what it means to be a Christian so that they can determine who's in and who's out. Once again, what matters most are not the boundaries around what you believe to be a Christian, but really what matters most is the direction that person is heading. This is really important issue. How exactly does redemption work? What is God doing to heal the brokenness inside of us? Why does scripture talk like this seismic shift has happened when we become a person in Christ? And yet for some people, at least on the outside, they don't act all that different from the way they were before. Well, think of it like this. Before we know Christ, we're like an apple infected by an insect. Have you ever found a worm in an apple? It's so gross. There's only one thing worse than finding a worm in an apple. You know what that is? Finding half a worm in an apple. Okay, so the outside of the apple may look delicious and even appear to be healthy, but internally, it's been infected by an insect. The core is rotten. The, the rot has spread to contaminate other parts of the apple, slowly turning it brown. By the way, do you know how the worm gets inside an apple? Now, you might think that the worm burrowed its way in from the outside, but that's not true. The worm actually comes from inside the apple. Well, how does that get? I mean, how does a worm get in there? Well, simple. An insect lays an egg on an apple blossom. Then sometime later, the worm hatches in the heart of the apple, then eats its way out. Sin is like that worm. It begins in the heart and works its way out into a person's thinking, feeling, and behavior. It's why Jesus taught us that it's not the things that come from outside of us that cause all of our problems. It's what comes from within. So when God wants to do a work in our life, he doesn't change us from the outside in, but from the inside out. In order to be made whole, we need for our core to be healed. Think of it like this. Sin is like an infection at the core of our life, or as scripture refers to it, our heart. Of course, to Jewish people, the heart is not just where you feel things, like the way we use the word heart in English. To the Hebrews, the heart was the very center of our being, the core, the fountainhead of our personality as it's expressed in our thoughts, feelings, and actions. So from the heart, I think, from the heart, I feel, from the heart, I act. The healing of the core of the self, of the heart, is what salvation is all about. You know, the first book I ever read that really addressed this was a book by Dr. Archibald Hart called Me, Myself, and I. Dr. Hart is a very unique individual. He's passed on since, but he held two PhDs, one in psychology and the other in theology. So he really understands people well, but he knows the Bible equally well. 
And he talked about how being born again is really only the beginning of an experience of transformation, that God begins the process of transformation by healing our core. In that way, redemption is kind of like the antidote to the poison of sin. It begins at the heart of who we are. Over time, and as we cooperate with God, it slowly begins to spread out into all the other parts of our life where the original infection of sin had spread, into our thoughts, into our feelings, and into our actions. The truth of the matter is this. There are some people with whom the disease of sin spread more quickly and more thoroughly and over a great many years. Yes, inside, at their core, they have been made new. But it's just going to take some time before this inner healing works its way out to touch every aspect of their life that's been tainted and distorted by sin. This is why we have to always look first for the direction people are heading. On the outside, you can't always tell who's redeemed, who is not. If you're making your decisions based purely on observable behavior, you're likely to get it wrong. Some people may still use rough language, still struggle with habitual sins, may appear quite rough around the edges, but they're seeking God. They're moving in His direction. They're wanting this new life and leaning into their healing, which, by the way, is one of the surest signs that God is working our life. We want the things of God. Here's how the Bible says it. God is always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey His purpose. Notice the words willing and able. In other words, God creates the want to, and then he empowers the how to. So God creates the willing in us, willingness in us to do it his way. That old stubborn selfishness inside is changing. The desire that things go my way is being eclipsed. God makes me willing, then he makes me able to obey his purposes. And it's always in that order. The willingness always comes first. So let me just say, I cannot, even as a spiritual leader, Create the hunger of God. Create that hunger for Him in you. I can't do that. That's something only God and God alone can do. If you have those desires, it's because God is stirring up those desires. That's a positive sign of His work in you. And if those desires are completely absent, then there's, that's reason enough to consider whether or not you truly know Him. So we don't measure a person's spirituality by their accomplishments. We measure their spirituality primarily by their hunger for God. So the spiritual life begins with a pivot where I turn from living a self-styled life and begin to pursue God, even though I may not really understand or fully know him all that well. The next stage on the journey is all about expanding our understanding and experience of God. This is what Jesus came to do, to teach us, model for us, and ultimately die for us to show us the goodness of God. So yes, of course, I want to lead people to Jesus. But in the same way that each and every day I surrender as much of me as I know to as much of God as I understand, same thing happens with Jesus. I'm constantly surrendering my life to him. I think the absolute worst teaching that exists in the church today is that surrender is a one-time deal, that it's a one and done. People think that because one time 20 or 30 years ago, they walked an aisle and said the words of commitment, that that's all there is to commitment. That's not me, and that's not what the Bible teaches. I'm a believer. I didn't just give mental assent to the truth that Jesus is who he claimed to be and did what the gospel said he did. I live the implications of that every day. You know, sometimes I even wonder, am I really a preacher or just a Christian who took the words of Christ seriously? Now, I know in many ways I still fall short, but I'm heading in his direction. So are you a follower of the way? Have you met Jesus on this journey? Is he becoming more and more precious with each passing year? Now, next week, I want to tell you, we're going to talk about what it means to walk with him, how we do that, how we cooperate with what God is doing. So don't miss it. But right now, would you just join me for a word of prayer? Father, I am so grateful that you are faithful to draw us to yourself. At some point in many of our lives, we made this pivot. We, we were going down one path, one direction. And suddenly we became aware, either by crisis or curiosity uh, or, or just really being influenced by people that we saw who had something that we didn't have. God, we, we began to open our life to you. And in the process of opening our life to you, what we discover in the word is that you are faithful to reward that search, that God, you meet us where we are with exactly what we're needing, that Lord, you will guide us into a deeper understanding of yourself. And you sent your son to do just that. 
So Jesus taught us about who you are, and Jesus modeled for us who you are, and Jesus died ultimately to demonstrate who you are. And so Jesus Christ now becomes the conduit through which we know you, through which we experience you, through which we come to understand that we really are loved, and we are loved for who we are because we were loved at our worst, that you love us through and through, that you love us without condition. It's that fundamental healing, our soul fear, that needs to be healed, that needs to be lifted because it is literally the fountainhead of every other fear in our life. I pray, God, for anyone who doesn't know you in a personal relationship, that, that Lord, they, they've made that turn, they have been seeking you, but now maybe for the first time, they're coming to understand what it means to believe, to believe that what you accomplished on the cross was done for them. That, that the great exchange, you're taking our place, you're taking our penalty, you're taking our sin, our brokenness, our unrighteousness upon yourself, and in exchange, giving us God's goodness, giving us his righteousness, giving us a brand new sense of acceptance and understanding. God, for anybody who, who, who wants to know, to know Jesus Christ in a personal relationship, it is not hard. It is not difficult. It really is about believing. But believing is so much more than just saying, I get the facts, I get the truth, I believe it happened. But to say, I believe in this so much, I believe it is the way. I believe it's my way. I believe it's the way for all human beings, and I want to commit myself to following in the way of Jesus. I believe that what he did on the cross was for me. I believe it so much that I accept that free gift into my life. And I, I ask God that you would help me to understand it more and to grow in my knowledge of Jesus and my understanding of him and yieldedness to him. I pray, Father, that you would ignite a fire in so many hearts and so many lives and so many people who, who've just seemingly grown content to just have Jesus and nothing else. Lord, I, I just don't even know what to do with a person who doesn't hunger for you because, God, that's an appetite you can create and only you can create. And so whether we're just continuing to just feast on junk, the junk food of life and therefore have no appetite? Or, or, or God, maybe people right now are in tune with that appetite but have been very frustrated because of their experience with Christians and their experiences with churches. God, I don't know all the reasons for that, but I do know this, that if there's a hunger there, no matter what the exterior looks like, no matter how much we, we may still struggle with areas where we feel defeated, where we feel enslaved, where we feel like we've got habitual uh, sins and weaknesses in our life, that God, in all those places, you want to move to set us free by setting us free first and foremost at our core, healing the, the essential brokenness of our core so that it spreads out and touches every aspect of our life. Thank you, God, for what you're teaching us. God, continue to lead us throughout this series as we learn more and more about what it means to be a follower of the way. In Jesus' name, I pray it all. Amen. Thanks for being with us today. We're always grateful that you would carve out this time, share this message, like this message, but more importantly, be a witness to others. I mean, this is our great privilege to share with others the good news of what we have found along the way. God bless you. I hope it's a great week.